good morning. Welcome to City Coast Church Online. We're so glad to see you today and we're going to have a great morning together. First, we're going to sing. Treasure the faith. 
What amazing words that we've been singing together this morning. I love the words that we've been singing in that bridge. And when He moves and when we pray, where stood a wall now stands a way, where every promise is amen. When God moves, make no mistake because the bowels of hell begin to shake. Church, do we believe these words that we're seeing this morning? We've been talking so much about prayer and the power of our prayers over the past few weeks. And can I encourage you this morning that there is so much power as we begin to pray, as we begin to allow God to move in our lives this morning. And I wanna encourage you to stir faith today because God can move in your circumstances where you are right now, wherever you're sitting, wherever you're standing, God can move in your circumstance. Matthew 17 verse 20 says, if you've got faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to a mountain, move from here to there and it will move. In the same way, how much more can God move in your circumstances right here and right now? As we sing these words together, we're going to see God move in amazing ways. But can I encourage you in this moment to visualise those things you're believing God for? Let's just pray together this morning. God, we lift up every prayer request, every need that we're facing today. God, for every house, every marriage, every job, every ounce of health that we're believing you for today. God, we pray for breakthrough in this moment. We pray for answers. We pray for miracles here in this moment. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Church, we're going to sing this together one more time. And if you can declare these words, let's believe for breakthrough this morning. Let's sing together. Sing His praise. 
Can I encourage you to continue singing this song this week? Can I encourage you to continue believing God for breakthrough this week? Because God is doing something new. He is wanting to move in your circumstances today, this week. And so can I encourage you to continue that? And we also have an amazing email, stories at citycoast.church, where we would so love to hear every answer to prayer, every miracle that you've been seeing over lockdown. Perhaps you've not let us know what stories you've been seeing in your life. We would so love love to hear them. We want to celebrate you. We want it with you. And uh, we just love hearing testimonies of how good God has been in your life. So um, keep the stories coming. That's stories at citycoast.church. We'd love to hear from them, from you. Um, we want to say a huge welcome to everyone joining us this morning. If you're visiting with us, we would so love to connect with you. Do feel free to say hi in the online chat. Uh, we've also got a next steps button at the top of the screen where we would so love to connect with you this week, give you a call. We'd love to see in person, but obviously it's a bit tricky right now, but we would love to give you a call, at least on the phone. As we talked about a few weeks ago, we've got the most amazing resource that's available to us as a church for free, and it's a mental health course called Empower. It's an online course. Um, it normally costs over £200, um, but it is just such an amazing resource that is free, available to us. And as we know, COVID-19 and the whole coronavirus has been a difficult time for all of us. And I think really, we've probably all struggled a bit mental health-wise. And so this is an online course which you can just email us and we will send you the link with the videos and online resources and it's really just an amazing tool to help us all in this season. So um, the email for that one is hello at citycoast.church and we will send you the link and all the details that you will need. Well today Jamie is bringing the message this morning so I hope you've got your tea and coffee or maybe breakfast and brunch whatever you're having at home. Um, I hope you've got it all ready and let's jump straight into the message this morning. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be together this morning. And the answer is yes. I am wearing a shirt with many, many pineapples on it. If you can't see from there, it is covered in pineapples. I'm just believing with this monochrome Hawaiian shirt, I'm really just believing that summer is on its way. And we're in summer and believing for the hot weather to come back. I hope you're with me in that belief. But can I say, we had an unbelievable time last Last week in drive-through prayer and just a big thank you to everyone who came out for that and connected with us. We loved praying with you and standing in agreement with you and we're going to be doing that again sometime soon so watch out for the day and get ready for that. This morning the title of this talk is Taming Lions. We live in a culture that is continually moving further and further away from God. And although we see great hope in the local church all the way around the world, we live in a generation that chooses to reject God and His heart for humanity. And I think that as Christians, we need to know how do we navigate this? How do we live a godly life in an ungodly culture? How do we remain anchored to our faith when the trends and the tides of cultural change threaten to kind of move us away? This morning, we're going to look at a man in the Bible named Daniel and his incredible story. And if you've grown up in church, if you've been to kids' church, you've probably more than likely heard the story of Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. And I want to put forward this morning that Daniel was actually surrounded by lions 60 years before he ever went into the den. That actually, although he was surrounded by physical lions in the den, he was actually the moment that he left Jerusalem and entered Babylon, that he was surrounded by cultural lions that confronted his every move. Next week, we're going to be beginning a series on the call of God and what it is to be called by God. But today, what I want to talk about is one of the biggest strategies that the enemy uses to attack and to derail our faith and how we can stand strong in God in the midst of cultural change. 
What's amazing about the book of Daniel is it's made up of 12 chapters. Well, the first six chapters are all history. They're great stories of what God was doing through this man's life. And then the last six chapters were all prophecy. They were visions and dreams of the future that Daniel had. And what's really interesting is this book of history was actually placed in the prophecy section of the Bible. The Bible isn't made up chronologically. It's made up in sections. And it's interesting that this history book was placed in the prophecy section. Well, this is important because I believe what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us is that this history is actually prophecy. That, that we shouldn't just look at these as great Bible stories, but actually that this book of Daniel is a playbook. It's a book of strategy that you and I will need for when this comes around in our generation. That these stories are full of things that we are going to experience. And Daniel's life really was an incredible example of someone who didn't just endure culture. He actually began to influence it. And my prayer is this morning, is that we would be inspired by the life of Daniel, that we would stand strong, that we would tame the lions that surround us in this culture today. And so I really want to encourage you this morning and this week to be unpacking the book of Daniel, to allow God to speak to you through this book today. I wonder, I wonder this morning whether you like your name. I don't know if you've been in those times where someone might be on a website or they've got a book and it's all about the meaning and the origins of names. I've, I've shared this before. I've mentioned it before, but you know, there've been many times in my life where people will be there so excited hearing what their name means. It means mighty warrior, loved by God, grace of God. And I would sit there with great anticipation, ready to hear what my name means. And I'd be sitting there going, I'm ready. I want to walk around confident with my head held high and every time they would come around to me and they'd go oh James yeah that actually means the deceiver so I'm going you've got Joshua Lord of Salvation next to me on the other side you have David beloved by God and then you have James the deceiver in the middle so I decided I wasn't going to take this. I was going to go to a more reliable source. So I jumped on the Urban Dictionary where we go when we need the truth. And this is what the Urban Dictionary says. It says, people with the name James are generally known for their good looks, especially the eyes. And women are just simply attracted to them. All I can say is it is a gift. I know the pineapples are probably not doing me a service right now, but it is a gift. But here's the thing, even though my birth certificate says James Alexander Harland, it's not been the name that I have believed for many years growing up. You see, not being the most popular guy in school, often that means that you take on and you begin to carry different names. And the combination of some of my facial features, my parents being pastors and really having a haircut, which was just not helping at all, meant that I took on a bunch of different names, a bunch of different labels. Some of them were a Vicar Boy. I had an Alien Head. And the trouble with these is, you know, at first you kind of laugh them off. You hope that they won't stick. But the battle we have is in our culture. Our culture is constantly trying to rename us. And so I thought, you know, maybe I can put on a new persona. Maybe I can take on a new name. And if I do that, maybe I'd find the friendship and the acceptance that I was searching for. And so I thought, okay, if I can take a punch on my arm and hold in the pain, then maybe I'd gain a bit more credibility in the affirmation that I thought I needed. And so I got a big upgrade. My name went from alien head to punch bag. It might not sound like an upgrade, but I tell you it was when I was at school. It came with many bruises down my arms, but such was my deep desire to fit in and to be liked. But here's the truth. Until we discover and we know our God-given identity, we will believe the names and the labels that our culture places on us. 
until we know who God has called and created us to be, we will believe the labels and the names that people around us and in our lives have placed on us. And the problem is, at first, it might seem harmless, but the names that we allow to label us actually title the script that we live our life by. It's what we believe about ourselves that influences every decision we make and every action we take. That there is so much power in the words that are spoken over us. They have the power to create. We're reminded in the book of Genesis at the very beginning that the primary use of our words is not communication, but it is creation. And when we believe the words that people are speaking over us, they begin to form our identity. We're not talking about whether our lives reflect the characteristics of the names that we were given. No, no, what matters most is the name that we believe on our heart and in our mind. It's what we believe about ourselves that has the ability to create or tear down the call of God in our lives. The Bible says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And maybe for you, maybe you were labeled as a kid fat or or stupid. And even though you graduated with a degree and you've run half a marathon, you still live your life through the filter of those childhood labels. But maybe you've allowed sickness to define you. you. It's become more than your disease. It's actually become your identity. Maybe a relationship, maybe a heartbreak, a divorce, a betrayal. It's become your identity. Maybe just the circumstances of life, they have become your identity. What I want to ask you this morning is what names are you carrying today? What are the names, the labels, the definition that you have allowed to stick to you like chewing gum to a shoe? That there's something that you just, you know, the more we leave it and the more we walk, it, it, the, the bond, the attachment just gets tighter. I truly believe that the enemy's number one target for your life will not be your health. It will not be your finances, but it will be your identity. He will do everything he can to use culture to give you a name that stands in direct contrast to the name that God has given you. But here's the good news today. The good news is when we understand our true identity, God's definition of who we are, we can step into his demonstration of who we are created to be. It is only God who has the authority to define you. It is only God who has defined you and he has created you on purpose, for a purpose, with a complete identity. This is something that this man in the Bible, Daniel, he understood. He knew this and it is what helped him anchor his faith in the midst of captivity, in the midst of a time where he was being assimilated into a new culture. We read as we dive into Daniel 1, the context that we find ourselves in is that the nation of Israel had been overtaken by the king of Babylon. And as it had been overtaken, we see that Daniel and his friends, they had been forced to leave Jerusalem and to step into Babylon. And Babylon was a culture that basically it just elevated pleasure and the worship of idols and self-indulgence. It was everything but God. And we see that as they sought to assimilate Daniel and his friends into Babylonian lifestyle, they did this by trying to cast shadows over their identities. And this is what it says in Daniel 1 verse 3 to 4 and then on to 7. It says this, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, I don't think that's how you pronounce it, but we're going to go with that. The chief chief of his court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace.
Thomas. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. So what, what they were doing is trying to assimilate them into a new culture. goes on to say the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. If you've known the story of the fiery furnace, maybe some of those names will be uh, recognizable to you today. But what we see is that they wanted, the Babylonians, they wanted to rename these young men to completely abolish their former identities as a sign of new ownership. And we, as we compare the old names and the new names, I believe we get a clearer picture of the enemy's strategy to take away our god given identity. This is what it says. And honestly, I might be pronouncing all these names wrong, but let's just go with it this morning. From Daniel, which meant God is my judge, we have Belshazzar, which means lady protect the king. We see that they changed the gender of Daniel's name, an intrinsic part of his identity. And they actually changed the focus from God and to man. We see that for Hananiah, it, which meant Yahweh, God has been gracious to then Shadrach, which meant I am fearful of God. Again, they inverted the focus from a loving and gracious God to a bad and fearful God. Number three, they it went from uh, Mishil, which meant who can compare to my God? No one. To Meshach, which says I am despised, contentable and humiliated. That they shifted the focus from our confidence in God to the cowardice of man. And then finally, the final one from Azariah, which meant Yahweh, God has helped, to Abednego, which meant the servant of Nebo. His name went from being a child of God to being a slave to man. That the Babylonian culture that these four men were living in was out to completely obliterate the God nature that was represented in these guys' names. It was out to rename them w with an identity which served their culture. And can I tell you, over two and a half thousand years later, I believe the enemy's strategy has not changed. That he will use any opportunity to cast confusion over the goodness of God, to cast confusion over our identities. That what the enemy does is he distorts our identity from being something based in the beauty and the destiny of God to being all about serving men and finding the approval of men being enslaved to people. It's like our phones, these affirmation devices, our social media begins to control us and we're saying to the world, do you like me? And God is saying, you already have the one like that really matters and that is the love of God. And just like in Babylon, this distraction and this shift in focus can cause us to orientate our lives away from God and onto people seeking affirmation, acceptance, and approval. And if we are going to tame the lion that is surrounding us today, we've got to know who we are. I love this quote. It is easier to resist the winds of change when our roots run deep in God's truth. So let me tell you, what is our identity in God? What does God say about our identity today? Well, here's the good news. In Jeremiah 1.5, He says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. What he's saying is before we were anything, God knew us. Before we were anything, God gave us identity. That we are the workmanship of God. We were created in His image. That we are a child of God, created with a purpose and a God-given identity, which no one else on this planet has. That you are an ambassador of God. You're a co-heir with Jesus. You've been adopted into the family of the King. The Bible tells us that we are a royal priesthood. That, that we were born for such a time as this. Then greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. This is your identity. 
It is the truth of God's Word that transforms and exposes the lies of the enemy in our life. It is the goodness of God. And as we stand strong, we, we stand strong when we have His Word, the Bible, as the uncompromised mirror to our lives. As we discover our identity in the words, not man has spoken over us, but our God has spoken over us. As we open the Bible and we say, God, tell us who we are. And maybe today you realize that you've accepted culture's definition of who you are. That maybe you've allowed our culture to distort your view of beauty and your view of success. That maybe you've come to a point where you've allowed others to create the standards in which you are measured up by. And maybe you just say subconsciously or consciously, you've allowed others to define your identity, define it based on your appearance or your character traits. That maybe you've allowed the pain of your past and the mistakes you've made to become a part of your identity and the words kind of failure and unclean and messed up and mistake that they kind of just dominate your thinking and they undermine your faith. What can I say? Today is a day to let go of those labels. Today is a day to tame the lion that is robbing you of your God-given destiny. It is a day to begin to speak out God's definition of who you are and step in to His demonstration of who you are created to be. It's a moment where we say, God, show me who I am. Show me that I am a child of Yours. God, I give you full control to come and restore my broken identity. Our awareness of being the person God has called us to be will permeate through everything we do. Every action we make, every decision that we take, it will permeate through everything. And really, as we prepare for starting a new series next week on calling, I want to encourage us this week as a church to take time to say, God, would you help me step out of the labels that have been placed on me over my past however many years? And God, would you show me who I am? Would you show me your definition of me? Would you show me my identity in you? We see for Daniel that, When the king continually tried to assimilate him into Babylonian culture, he was offering him food and wine and really a new definition of who he was. We see that Daniel declined. See, Daniel, before he even stepped foot in Babylon, he knew his identity. He knew who he was. And so when what the king was offering came before him, that lifestyle, Daniel said, hey, that doesn't line up with the destiny and the definition that God has given me. And so he declined the king's offer. Daniel stood strong in the face of cultural compromise. And what we see is that within 10 days time, Daniel and his friends, they were invited into the inner circle of leadership for the king. I love this because he began to influence the culture that was trying to redefine who he was. I love this. Daniel, he was promoted not because of his compromise, but because of his conviction, because he knew who he was. He knew who he was. He stood strong in his identity in God. His roots were deep in the truth that God was speaking over his life and say he was not swayed when the cultural pressure, when the lions were surrounding him. The battle of culture that seeks to define you, God will use to refine you. And I want to encourage you today that you might feel like you are surrounded by lions right now challenging you, confronting you. Know this, that God will use that same situation to strengthen and affirm your identity in Him. We grow in the midst of the trial. Church, as I come to a close, I want to encourage you to know three things today. Number one, you are born for such a time as this. God looked to all of history and He made no mistake. He placed you here today. Number two, that you have gifts and purposes within your identity that God has called you to. And number three, we experience the fullness of our identity when we help others discover theirs. 
Church, we're going to pray this morning. I pray this prayer becomes a catalyst for what God is going to do in our lives. God, we thank you that you call us your own. We thank you that before we were even born, you knew us. You gave us identity. You gave us a name, and that is child of God. And I thank you that even though after many years, so many of us, we have picked up names and labels, I thank you that in a moment, you can help us drop those labels. And right now, I just pray for everyone watching this service that feels like they're carrying a label put on them, not by you. God, I pray that that journey of letting go of the names and the labels that culture has put on us will begin today and that we would know who we are in you. God, let us be a church that know our identity in you when the cultural wind and the, and the trends and the tides of the culture around us begin to blow us and begin to try and tackle us and derail us. God, I pray that we would stand strong because of our faith in you, because we know who we are as a church. God, this week I pray you would reveal to us who we are as we open your word, your Bible. Show us who we are in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, one of the greatest identity changes in our lives is when we go from being a sinner to being saved. And maybe you're watching this service this morning and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. You haven't entered a relationship with God. You don't know what it is to be saved, to experience salvation. And this morning, I want to let you know that Jesus, He came to this earth on a search and a rescue mission for all of humanity. He didn't come to start a religion, but to be a bridge between us and God, our brokenness and God's perfection. And He died on the cross, carrying all the weight of our brokenness, all the weight of our mistakes and our wrongdoing and our regrets and all of our sin. And today, He is offering you new life. He is offering you forgiveness from your past. And He is offering you a hope for your future. Right now, Jesus, He is knocking on the door of your heart saying, Will you let me in? And this morning, if you've never made this decision or maybe you have in the past and you've just drifted away from God and today you're saying, I want to choose to follow God again. I want to enter a relationship with Jesus. Well, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer after me. We're gonna pray it together. Jesus, today, I choose to follow you. I am sorry for my sin. Thank you for dying for me. Jesus, save me. Come into my life. Help me know your love and grace for the rest of my days. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Wow, well, what an amazing message this morning. When we know who we are, when we know our identity in God, we can stand strong in every single situation. If you made that decision to follow Jesus this morning, can I just say that is the best decision you will ever ever make and we are celebrating with you this morning. We just love to make um, those decisions, but it's so important that we make them a life-changing decision, not just for one moment. And so we would love for you to click the next steps button on the top of your screen and we would just love to connect with you this week. It's just a few bits of information you can add in there and we can resource you, we can help you get connected um, and just really help you on your next step, which is so, so exciting. Well, we've got City Kids TV happening at 11.15 a.m. on this same channel. Um, Oh my goodness, last week it was hilarious. I was actually crying with laughter. It was so, so funny. So if you've got children, make sure they tune in to City Kids TV at 11.15 a.m. on here. We've also got Verve Youth happening at 4 p.m. on the Verve Youth YouTube channel. So if you're a teenager, make sure you check that out. But otherwise, church, have an amazing week. Send us your stories. We'd love to hear them. Um, But have an amazing week. We're praying for you. We love you. And we'll see you Sunday at 10 a.m.